want to share with you this morning about a time when I was saved, when I was made more righteous and more holy and more whole and more well and more connected to deep inside my heart than I had ever been. I had one of my most religious conversion experiences over a period of 12 weeks in the fall of 1980. I was 14. Cosmos, a personal voyage, was broadcast for the first time in September of that year. I caught the first episode totally by accident, as is the way it usually happens with a spiritual awakening. It was like walking into a church service. I was hooked. I didn't know I needed this. There it was. I was saved. I climbed directly aboard Carl Sagan's ship of the imagination, and I did not miss an episode for the next 12 weeks. Not only was I hooked on science in a way that chemistry and biology class had never been able to inspire, but I rediscovered and fell in love with public television in a way I hadn't since Sesame Street. Oh, I was 14. I was caught up in what Carl Sagan calls one of the varieties of scientific experience. It was also a religious experience. My heart quickened. I got chills up my spine. I had numinous experiences, experiences of knowing, of connection, that this, this science, this wonder, this discovery was real and true and valuable, and my spirit lift and soared. It was amazing. I remember the fluttering of my soul when I learned about the Drake equation. An equation designed to try and calculate how many technologically advanced civilizations there may be in the universe capable of communicating with us. I was blown away by the concept which may never be proved of nested universes where each elementary particle in one universe is a whole universe in itself, and our whole universe may be just an elementary particle in the next universe higher up. I tried to explain this feeling I was having to people, but it seemed no one else knew or was watching. Certainly none of my friends were interested. How could this be? This cosmos, I would learn later in life, was the most watched public television program in America until Ken Burns' Civil War came along. And still, around the globe, it is the most watched program ever made by American public television. It seems the world was captivated, but I didn't know it. It won awards, the Peabody, an Emmy. It had a reboot a couple of years ago with Neil deGrasse Tyson, which I was also similarly captivated by. It was like reclaiming the religious tradition of your youth and going back, and it was even better than ever. But in 1980, with the original Cosmos, where was the person I could find in Lemonster, Massachusetts to talk about new worlds opening up inside me as the universe unfolded before me on television on Sunday and Tuesday nights. Yes, I watched the repeat episode every week. Carl Sagan, skeptic, agnostic, scientist, son of immigrant Russian parents grew up in Brooklyn. And he was a spiritual guy. He had given me a 14-year-old boy raised Catholic in a working class town in Massachusetts a young boy who had recently abandoned his Catholic faith tradition. He had given me a gift of God and the gift of not God. The gift of the quest and the seeker. The gift of the inquiring heart and mind and soul. And I knew, in a way 
my 14-year-old self could not explain, that it was okay and beautiful and wondrous. As Sagan wove in quotes from Shakespeare and Greek philosophers and various world scriptures, with his, discuss his discussions of the Big Bang and special relativity and planetary exploration and the great library of Alexandria, the lives of Johannes Kepler and Galileo, I sat wrapped in the wonder of it all. I needed no altar, no choir, no event, no priest, no creed, no dogma, no need to be in church, for there I sat in the temple of the great mystery and wonder of the cosmos. In 1930, Albert Einstein wrote a statement called What I Believe. Part of that statement expresses how I felt as an adolescent experiencing the spirituality of science. Einstein wrote, the most beautiful and most profound emotion we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. The one to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. Their eyes are closed. To know that which is impenetrable to us really exists, manifesting itself as the highest wisdom and most radiant beauty which our dull faculties can comprehend only in the most primitive forms, this knowledge, this feeling, is at the center of all true religiousness. In this sense, and in this sense only, Einstein said, I belong to the ranks of truly religious people. And so do I. As Unitarian Universalists, the wonder of science helps us to have healthy skepticism. Not curmudgeon skepticism. Science helps us heed the guidance of reason. Along with our reason, the results of science help guard us against idolatries of mind and spirit. We all need to guard against these idolatries of the mind and the spirit. Because although Unitarian Universalism has no creed and no dogma, it is not an anything-goes religious tradition. There are some people, even some people within our own congregations, who are still under the assumption that Unitarian Universalism is about believing whatever you want. This is not true. A healthy skepticism helps us guard against pseudoscience, pseudo-psychology, superstition, and the latest spiritual fad. At the same time, we must watch our skepticism so that the life of our human mind and spirit does not become one long, continuous effort solely at debunking for its own sake. Fundamentalism is that practice which allows no other expression but its own dogma. There are fundamentalist skeptics and fundamentalist atheists and fundamentalist spiritualists and fundamentalist New Agers, as well as fundamentalist Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists. Science gives us the spiritual gift of critical thinking with which to temper the rest, and we do ourselves a grand disservice if we do not use it. In the book, Plato and a Platypus Walk Into a Bar, the authors tell this joke. Every morning, my neighbor used to step out on her front stoop and exclaim, Let this house be safe from tigers. Then she went back inside. Finally, my other neighbor said to her, What's all your hollering about? There's not any tigers within a hundred miles of here. In fact, there's not any tigers around here at all. To which my other neighbor said, See, it works. Post hoc ergo proctor hoc. Logical fallacy. In English, after this, therefore, because of this. It's the error of assuming that just because one thing follows another, the first thing caused the other. As human beings, we are not above seeing connections wherever we want them. We seek out patterns and means. This is a great and powerful thing. 
sometimes, however, it gets us into trouble. Science, guarding against idolatries of mind and spirit, asks us for the evidence. The more astounding the claims, the greater the proof science wants. Carl Sagan, in one of his books, said, what we need to use is our baloney detector. So what's in the baloney detector kit? Sagan says, our baloney detector needs the independent confirmation of facts. So we can sort facts from, well, alternative facts. Substantive debate on the evidence by knowledgeable proponents of all points of view. The baloney detector requires we eliminate arguments from authority. God, or the church, or the president, or my friend said it, therefore it must be true. No arguments from authority are allowed. We must spin more than one hypothesis, and remember Occam's razor, that given more than one hypothesis, usually it's better to go with the simpler one. The baloney detector requires we do not get overly emotionally attached to a hypothesis because it is our hypothesis. We must also see if the hypothesis itself can be falsified. If it can't, there's a problem. We need to avoid what is called ad hominem attacks, attacking the arguer instead of the argument. Reverend so-and-so is a biblical fundamentalist, therefore anything he says against evolution should not be taken seriously at all. Well, it's not because he's a biblical fundamentalist, it's because his argument isn't very sound. We must avoid appeals to ignorance. We must avoid special pleading, typically seen as appealing to God's will. Well, you just don't understand God, you just don't understand Scripture. We must avoid begging the question, assuming an answer in the way a question is phrased. We must have the death penalty to cut down violent crime, no? Observational selection must be avoided. Counting the hits and forgetting the misses. For example, I received one random email related to a grant proposal I'm working on in the community and hundreds of others of emails with absolutely no connection to anything I'm working on at all. So, I can't say that that email was of divine providence. Looking at just one example. We must, under, we must avoid misunderstanding the nature of statistics. What's called the Monte Carlo syndrome. Just because black comes up five times in a row, the chance of red coming up next is still 50-50. We must avoid the slippery slope, an unwarranted extrapolation for effect, give an inch and they take a mile. We must avoid the straw man, stereotyping or caricaturing a position or a person to make it or them easier to attack. Scientifically, we do need this baloney detection kit. Spiritually, we should use it too. In an unreasonable world, science is, as Carl Sagan notes, a candle in the dark. In a superstitious world, science dismisses the monsters under the bed and demons that haunt the night. There are many comforting ideas that come down the pop psychology and pop theology and pop religion path. Not all of them equally valuable, and some of them contain elements most definitely that run contrary to Unitarian Universalist principles and purposes. The beauty of science is that even though it prevents us from falling into an idolatry of the mind or spirit, it also opens up for us wide vistas for the soul to explore both our inner world and our outer world. We become amazed at the immensity and complexity of our universe and the immensity and complexity of ourselves. Far from condemning us to a world of pure reason, walking around like Mr. Spock, trying to exist in pure logic, science is mystical 
and awe-inspiring. Think about it. We still cannot reconcile the findings of general relativity with quantum mechanics. When in, in and of themselves, all the equations work, but they don't work together. There's so much we don't know. Carl Sagan wrote many scientific papers and many books, and he wrote a novel. It's been made into a movie since. It's the story of a young girl who grows up to be an astronomer, fascinated with the stars, and she gets involved in a project called SETI, a Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which is a real thing, by the way, and uses a huge array of radio telescopes around the world to search like it does in the novel, for radio transmitted signals that due to their particular pattern could only be generated by an intelligence somewhere else. And over the years in this real project, there have been blips, there have been things that, oh my God, we need to look further. Later found, nope, not enough evidence to say that was a generated signal we found. But in the book, this the astronomer Ellen Arroway finds a signal. It's confirmed. They rule out any other possibility that some intelligence had to have sent this. They take a long time decoding what it is. Finally, they discover that it's the instructions to build the spaceship. So they build the ship. After much political arguing and having to reconcile Russia and China and the United States and everybody else, they build the ship. And a handful of people are selected. And Ellen is selected to be the representative of the United States that goes in the ship. And they crank up the ship and it spins around. The people in the ship have this fantastic adventure where they meet aliens and travel through wormholes and experience black holes and do all this stuff. And the aliens tell them, we still haven't found the answers to everything. We do not know yet where all this came from or how it still works in some ways. Fascinating. And they get back in their ship and they go home. They walk out and they're met with dumbfounded looks. What happened? What do you mean what happened? We had this grand experience. Like, no, no, no. You guys walked in there 30 seconds ago and just walked out. No one believes them. As they struggle to reconcile their real experience with what was observed, the scientists who made up the crew have to confess that yeah, I don't believe us either. A televangelist calls up Ellen and says, I imagine you want us all to take it on faith. But it inspired her. And she set to work finding out some of the unknown answers that the aliens told her they were still looking for. And so she sets computers up to calculate pi on and on and on into infinity. And years later, miles and miles and miles downstream of the decimal point, her computers find something calculating pi. This is from the novel. The anomaly showed up most starkly in base 11 arithmetic, where it could be written out entirely as zeros and ones. Compared with what had been received from the aliens, this could be at best a simple message, but its statistical significance was incredibly high. The program resembled digits, and it assembled them into a square raster, an equal number across and down. The first line was an uninterrupted file of zeros left to right. The second line showed a single numeral one exactly in the middle, and zeros to the borders left and right. After a few more lines, an unmistakable arc had formed, composed of ones. The simple geometric figure had been quickly constructed, line by line, self-reflective, rich in promise. The last line of the figure emerged, all zeros except for a single centered one. The subsequent line, all zeros, part of the frame. Hiding in the alternating patterns of digits deep inside a transcendental number, was a perfect circle. Its form traced 
by unities in a field of knots. The universe was made on purpose, the serpent said. In whatever galaxy you happen to find yourself, you take the circumference of a circle, divide it by its diameter, measure closely enough and long enough and uncover a miracle, another circle, miles from the decimal point. There may be richer messages farther in. It didn't matter what you look like or what you're made of or where you come from as long as you are in this universe and have a modest talent for mathematics sooner or later. You will find it. It's already here, inside everything. You don't need to leave your planet to find it. In the fabric of space and in the nature of matter as in a great work of art. There is written small the artist's signature. A fascinating journey of imagination, but the kind to which science opens us up to. We haven't found that in Pi yet. We may never. We don't know. The final majesty and spirituality of science is like our Unitarian Universalist faith tradition. It is never finished. There is always more to learn and more to unlearn. Once what we once thought was so may turn out to not be so. And yet there is wisdom to be found in the journey. It is why we still read the Bible and the Quran and the Vedas and Shakespeare and Whitman and Carl Sagan. Because each of them is part of this grand human journey we share. Each of those things a volume in the great journal of our search for truth and meaning, each of them a candle in a demon-haunted world, each of them something that, if we allow it, saves us. <laughs>